Chapter 12 The Hyperion Beneath us the Hyperion rode the wind like a great airborne whale, cutting the icy sky with her flukes. From the windows of the control car, I watched as Hal brought us closer. Sometimes, as if aware of our harpooner's intent, the Hyperion dipped and slewed. Other times, trying to scare us off, she crested, forcing us away from her massive, sun-bleached back. Hal's crew were expert sailors, and even without a full complement of engines, they managed to mirror the Hyperion's every movement. Through the night, we'd kept well back, shadowing her, but now the dawn gave us enough light to attempt a boarding. Bring me in lower, Hal told his crew. Bring me in nice and close now so I can get a line on her. She's enormous, I said. She must have 700 feet on her. 750, and she'll be all ours soon. From the ceiling of the control car, Hal pulled down a periscope-like column of controls, entwined with bundles of cables. The control console hung at chest level, studded with all manner of dials and levers, and on either side were maneuverable brass handles with rubber grips. Hal grasped the handles and swiveled them forward in tandem. There was a harsh whirring sound beyond the windows, and I looked out to see a pair of mechanical arms unfolding themselves from the ship's hull, like the limbs of a praying mantis. As they extended, they seemed spindly things, but then I saw that their sinew was braided alumiron cable, near unbreakable. The limbs bulged with universal joints and massive shock absorbers and were tipped with a thick loop of cable and pincers. Give Dorje a ring, Hal told me, and tell him we're ready to lock on. I picked up the ship's telephone and called the aft docking station near the Sagarmatha's stern. Dorje was stationed there, and I assumed he was manning an identical set of arms, ready to guide them toward the Hyperion's back. I relayed Hal's message to him and hung up as the saga made a sudden leap. Stay sharp, Hal told Jengbu and Ang Jetta at the helm. She's lively down there. Through the windows of the control car floor, he had a clear view of the two mechanical arms stretching down toward the Hyperion. Hal squeezed the trigger on both his handles, and down below the arm's pincers opened wide aimed for the Hyperion's forward mooring cleats. At that moment, the great ship dipped and shuddered, leaving the arms dangling over empty air. Bring her back, bring her back. Within seconds, the saga stole over the Hyperion once more. Come here, me darling, Hal muttered. I saw his fingers tighten around the brass handles. Just a little nudge to port. I'm almost there. He shoved the brass handles hard. The arm suddenly lunged, pincers gaping like the jaws of some deadly eel. On both port and starboard sides, they connected with the Hyperion's mooring cleats and bit down. Got her! cried Hal. Throttle back and hold tight, gents. We're on an Nantucket sleigh ride. Long ago, when men had harpooned the great whales, they were often taken on a wild ride through the waves by their quarry, and so it was with the Sagarmatha. she just coupled with a ship six times her size and was now being pulled through the glacial sky, dipping and rolling. I wondered how long it would be before Miss Simpkins was airsick. The coupling arms were strong, yet supple. Buffered by huge springs, they compressed and stretched as needed but I realized they were also designed to hold the other ship at a distance. The Hyperion could only ride up so close before the arms locked and prevented a collision. I just hoped her ancient mooring cleats did not rip free. The ship's telephone rang, and Hal grabbed it. Good work, Dorje, he said, and hung up. He turned to me and gave a wink. We're locked on. I'm not going to waste time lying, 
Hal told us all in the lounge. The saga is seriously damaged, and it's changed our plan of attack. I'd originally intended to tow the Hyperion back to a safe harbor and salvage her there. It's a tricky business at the best of times, and with only four engines, we don't have enough power to attempt it safely. That means anything we want from the Hyperion, we have to salvage it from her mid-air. After the collision last night, I'd helped survey the damage. The ship's Illumiron's exoskeleton had done its job well, for the hull was unharmed and the skin torn only in a few places. None of the gas cells had been ruptured. But, as Hal had feared, the aft and amidships engine cars had been crumpled against the port flank and now dangled from their twisted struts. We'd done all we could to lash down the wreckage, but Hal would need a dry dock to repair his custom-built engine cars. It made me sick to look upon them. Even though I was sure the collision couldn't have been avoided, I was up there in the lookout when it happened, and it would always feel like a failure. First priority is the money, Hal continued. Gold, banknotes, jewels, that's what we're looking for. Everything else comes second. That was not my understanding of our agreement, Kate objected. Things have changed, said Hal. I've lost a member of my crew. I've got expensive repairs to look forward to. He held up his hand to cut off Kate. I know you wanted the taxidermy. Likely, we won't be able to take everything. If it fits up the ladders, we'll try it. Otherwise, it stays with the ship. And even that depends on weather and time. Every hour we stay up here, we get weaker. Especially you lot who aren't used to these heights. Right now the winds are light, but if the weather sours, we may have to break off our salvage. Could be a matter of life and death. Are we clear on this? Kate's nostrils narrowed, and her eyes strayed to me for a moment. I wondered if she was angry with just Hal, or me too. Maybe she actually blamed me for the damage to the saga. Maybe she thought I'd been up there smooching with Nadira and not paying attention. Cruz, you'll be boarding with Dorje and me. The rest of you will stay aboard the saga. What? Nadira said in disbelief. I'm going aboard, Kate said angrily. I didn't come all this way to knit socks by the hearth. I'm perfectly content to knit by the hearth, said Miss Simpkins, who was, in fact, knitting by the hearth. You're both brave, spirited young ladies, Hal said, and I could tell he was somewhat taken aback by the ferocity in their faces. I'm just thinking of your safety. You've no experience working salvage. It's going to be hard work. You'll slow us down. Kate! I think your parents would want you to stay behind, her chaperone said. It's too dangerous. I need to examine the specimens before I know which ones I want, Kate said. Hal, I absolutely insist on it. The cargo bay doors don't open without my key, Nadira told Hal, and it stays around my neck until I'm aboard the Hyperion. The two girls looked at each other and almost smiled. You'll take one look out the hatch and think better of it, Hal said. They're equal to the challenge, I told him, and we'll work faster with a few more sets of eyes and hands. Fine, Hal said, but if you fall behind, it's back to the saga for good. I'll not be hindered playing nursemaid. I'll have Mrs. Ram alter some sky suits for you. Cruz, we need to start assembling the gear. We board in one hour. This is your sky suit. Dorje said, holding a thick hide garment out to me. It was a single piece of clothing, trousers, coat, and hood, all painstakingly sewn together with the smallest stitches I'd ever seen. The hide was soft and tanned and lined inside from hood to heel with a layer of fur thicker and wider than any I'd ever seen. It's Snow Leopard from the Himalayas, Dorje explained. Strip down to your underwear and put it on. Uh, shouldn't I keep my clothes on for extra warmth? I'd seen the thermometer outside. It was more than 30 below. They'll make you too bulky, Hal said, unbuttoning his shirt and revealing a well-muscled chest. The suits are designed to fit snugly. 
Wear the leopard fur next to your skin, and you'll have the heat of the leopard, Dorje said. We were in the boarding bay, just aft of the passenger quarters along the keel catwalk. The hatch was still closed, and the electric heating coils along the baseboards glowed and struggled vainly against the mighty cold. The hull might as well have been made of gauze. Kami Sherpa was checking the winch that would lower us the fifty feet to the Hyperion's back. Arranged neatly on the floor was all our gear, to be divided among our five rucksacks. Oxygen tanks and breathing masks were laid out. Hoping Kate and Nadira would not come in as I was undressing, I hurriedly pulled off my trousers, wool sweater, and shirt. I started shivering. You'll need some more meat on those bones, Hal said. I pulled the sky suit to me and slipped my legs into the trousers. The fur caressed me, warming me instantly. I shrugged my arms into the sleeves of the coat and drew it around me. There were two rows of complicated clasps to do up, and by the time they were all done, I had almost forgotten the cold that had assailed me moments before. I felt the snow leopard's skin against mine, felt its heat gathering against me. I stood, worried the suit would make me clumsy, but it was amazingly supple, yielding to every bend of my knee or elbow or waist. It fit me like a second skin. I stepped into the boots. They too were lined with leopard fur, their soles fitted with thick, vulcanized rubber treads to give me good footing on the ship's icy back. Gloves, said Hal, tossing me a pair. I slid them on. They did not even hamper the flex of my fingers. They became my fingers. Ah, here are our fine young lady adventuresses, Hal said, looking very fetching in their skin suits, I must say. It gave me quite a shock when I looked up and saw Kate and Nadira, both clothed in their snow leopard garments, striding toward me. Their dark hair spilled over the white fur of their hoods. Their boots made them taller, and the hide suits lent them the lithe power of mountain cats. Mrs. Ram is very handy with the needle, Kate said. Marjorie was most impressed by how quickly she did the alterations. Let's suit up, said Hal. Safety harnesses first. I helped Kate with hers, showing her all the places where it needed to be cinched and clipped. I offered to help Nadira, but she just shook her head and seemed to be managing fine on her own. Hal held up a small tank for all of us to see. Inside your rucksacks will be your oxygen tanks. It's good for four hours. Half a turn opens the valve. Depending how acclimatized your bodies are, you may not need it all the time. I'd like you three to wear your masks at least until we're inside the Hyperion. I want you all at your strongest when we're on the ship's back. You don't use oxygen at all? Kate asked Dorje. I bring a tank, but I have no need of it, the Sherpa replied. I grew up at altitudes not much lower than this. Everest is 30,000 feet, said Hal. This is a stroll. Hal finds oxygen unmanly, said Dorje and I wasn't sure if there was a glimmer of gentle mockery in his eyes. Inside the Hyperion, you can take the masks off if you feel comfortable, Hal said. But the moment you feel faint or clumsy or start shivering, the mask goes on again. If you need to vomit, remove the mask and replace it when you're finished. If you have trouble breathing or develop a blinding headache or your vision falters, tell me. You'll need to go back to the saga right away. We put on our rucksacks. The oxygen tanks within were surprisingly light. Goggles stay on until we're inside. Hoods stay up, gloves on at all times. You take them off, your skin will start freezing in seconds. When I give the word, we return to the ship. No argument. We take no chances in Skyberia. The cold is bad, but the altitude will kill you faster. It takes different people at different speeds. I don't know what we'll find, but it'll likely to be unpleasant. There will be bodies. We don't know what happened to the ship. There may have been a mutiny, a skyjacking, plague, or some other form of disaster that brought death to the entire crew. We won't be able to hear one another outside on the ship's back, so here's what we're going to do. Step by step, he took us through the boarding procedure, as stern and relentless as a drill sergeant. 
I watched Kate and Nadira's faces for signs of fear. Nadira was composed, and Kate's forehead bore a furrow of concentration. Hoods up, said Dorje. I'm about to open the hatch. I pulled up the hood, feeling the soft fur encase me. The lower portion buttoned up, leaving only a slit for my eyes, now covered by goggles. All sound was muffled. I was eager to get outside, for I was starting to sweat. Dorje pulled a lever, and the bay door split apart and rolled flush with the ship's underbelly. Cold gushed in, but I felt it only against the exposed portion of my face, for the snow leopard suit protected me so well. I looked straight down to the Hyperion's back, shimmering like a mirage, glinting with ice. I could not understand how she had stayed aloft so many years, uncaptained, clawed, and pummeled by the winds. Dorje went first. He clipped his safety harness to the winch and sat down on the edge of the hatch. Ready? Kami Sherpa asked. Dorje nodded and pushed off into open air. The winch paid out line quickly. We all watched. Though light, the wind still twirled him about some. From our vantage point, it looked like he was swinging far out over the ship's flanks. As he neared the ship's back, he bent his knees and sat down gracefully, dead center. He quickly cleated his safety line to an icy guide rail, then unclipped himself from the winch. He gave the signal, and Kami Sherpa started rolling the cable back in. Are you all right with this? I quietly asked Kate. Yes, she said tightly. You don't have to, you know. I dare say I'll quite enjoy it, she replied with a vigorous nod. Cruz, you're next, said Hal. Get that mask on. See you all down there, I said. I reached back into my rucksack and opened the tap on my oxygen tank. The mask was a translucent glass shield rimmed with rubber insulation that fit snugly over nose and mouth. It hissed faintly as I strapped it on. Instantly, I felt like I was suffocating. I yanked it down. I don't want it, I said. Breathe deep, slow, even breaths, Hal said. You'll get used to it. I'm fine. I don't need it. Put it on or you don't go down. Reluctantly, I strapped the mask back across my face. I did not want Kate and Nadira to think I was afraid of the descent. Truly, I was eager to be in the sky. It was the mask alone that scared me, the way it sealed off my mouth and nose from the air. It felt wholly unnatural. Claustrophobia clutched at my chest. I fought my panic and took a long pull through my mouth. The air had an unpleasant metallic tang. After a few more breaths, I felt the oxygen enter my lungs and my muscles unclenched a bit. I did not like it, but I could do it. All right, Hal said. I nodded. Kami Sherpa helped me hook my harness to the winch. I sat and pushed off over the edge and... Sky. 20,000 feet of it, spreading out all around me to all the horizons of the world. This high, it seemed the sky no longer had anything to do with the land or the sea below it. It was his own kingdom up here, here above the clouds, it scoffed at the idea of Earth. These were the wild deeps of the sky, where water existed only as unseen ice crystals, and the wind moved in secret aerial tides. I was but a speck. For a moment, I felt I had no right to be here, encased within my fur suit, breathing tanked air. Yet, this was my birthplace. Not so high, of course, but here nonetheless and the sky could not disown me. This was still my element more than the earth. Down I went. The wind met my face like a chisel. Even through the skysuit, I could feel the ferocious cold, just held at bay like some starving animal. Below me, far below the great bulk of the Hyperion, the clouds looked solid as sand dunes. I hoped none of those electrocuting aerozoans would cross my path, or another diabolical creature not yet discovered. It seemed whenever I was with Kate, some new species popped up and tried to eat us. On the ship's deck, 
Georgie was waiting for me, crouched low. My feet had barely touched down when he was clipping my safety line to the rail. I unclasped myself from the winch and gave Kami the signal to reel in. Dorje pointed at the forward crow's nest, and I began to make my way over while he stayed behind to help Kate and Nadira. Hal would come last. Bent low against the wind, I stepped carefully, for the ship's skin was icy, gritty in some places, sheer in others, as if a film of water had frozen instantaneously. I kept my safety line fastened to the rail, though it was rusty and pockmarked, and I had to wonder at its strength. The wind pinched at me. The cold etched a fissure of pain across my forehead. There was no sound but the muffled howl of the sky beyond the hood and my own panting through the mask. I reached the crow's nest, its glass observation dome thickly matted with frost. I tried the hatch. Locked. Hal's instructions were to get inside as quickly as possible. I reached into my rucksack and drew out a small pry bar. I wedged it under the latch, heaved down, and felt the lock give way. Bending to get a grip on the hatch's rim, I put my face to the dome. Through a clear patch in the ice, an eye was looking out at me. I gave a cry and jerked back, spluttering inside my mask and fighting the urge to rip it off. I forced myself to take deep breaths. With the edge of the pry bar, I scratched away more of the ice. Inside the crow's nest was a sailor, his head tipped against the glass, forehead frozen to it. His eyes were wide open. His skin was blackened by sun and time, but his body had been preserved completely. He was shrunken in his uniform. His mouth was slightly parted. One of his withered hands was frozen closed around the speaking tube. He seemed about to say something, only death had come along and interrupted him. Looking over my shoulder, I saw Kate cautiously shambling up beside me. Behind her, Nadira had just touched down, and soon Hal would arrive. I needed to get the hatch open. I removed my mask and shouted close to Kate's hood so she could hear me. There's a body! I pointed at the crow's nest, and she nodded. Then I bent down and heaved up the dome. Kate helped. Hinges shrieked and ice danced up in the air as the dome lifted. The sailor's forehead snapped free of the glass, and his whole body toppled forward, rigid as a mannequin. His face chunked against the metal rim of the open hatch, chipping away a piece of his cheek. I looked at Kate to see how she was doing but her entire face was hidden behind hood and goggles and mask. The body had to be moved, for it blocked the ladder. I jumped down into the crow's nest and began to shift it. It was difficult. He was heavy with ice, and his arms were sticking out. For a horrible moment, I wondered I might drop him, and he would shatter into a hundred pieces before my eyes. But suddenly Hal was in the crow's nest with me. He grabbed the body by the armpits, hefted it up, and heaved it out onto the ship's back. Before I could even object, Hal gave the body a good shove and sent it skidding over the hull's curve into the great blue sky. Without further ado, Hal started down the ladder. Dorje, standing near the hatch, gestured for Kate and Nadira to follow. Then I headed down myself. Out of the wind, it was not nearly as cold. The pain across my forehead eased. Light from the open hatch spilled down the thin rungs and faintly illuminated the ship's wooden ribs and the sides of her enormous gas cells. They were made from a kind of gold beater skin that hadn't been used for more than 20 years. Some of the bracing wires, I noted, were rope instead of alum iron cable. The Hyperion was a venerable ship among the first large airships to ply the skies. She was a piece of history, and it was a testament to the craftsmen who built her that she was still aloft. Above me, Dorje closed the hatch, and the companionway would have pl been plunged into gloom were it not for Hal's torchlight aimed from below. 
He was waiting on the catwalk with Kate and Nadira, who had removed their goggles and masks. I did the same. After the tanked oxygen, the thin air seemed meager fair at first, but within a few breaths, I was used to it once more. Seeing Hal and Dorje breathing normally without any help at all, I was determined not to use my mask again. Everyone all right? Hal asked. Kate and Nadira were breathing heavily, but they both nodded. In the frigid air, our breath plumed from our noses and mouths like dragon smoke. I can't believe you threw that man overboard, I said. My voice was small and hollow in the dark ship. He's not a man anymore, retorted Hal. He's ice, and he was in our way. It's not safe hanging about on the ship's back. The crow's nest needs to be clear for us and our cargo. It's our main thoroughfare. Everyone deserves a proper burial, said Kate. We could have lowered him down the ladder, I told Hal. If we snapped his arms clean off, maybe. That's time I won't waste. Now all of you, stow your sentimentality and save your breath. Hal's right, said Nadira. The way needed clearing. I glanced at Dorje, hoping for his support, but he said nothing. He either agreed with Hal or was too loyal to criticize his captain before others. I looked about in the dim light. Flanking the catwalk were the rippling walls of the gas cells, sparkling with ice crystals, forming a kind of canyon. We were on the axial catwalk, the maintenance corridor that ran through the very center of the ship, from bow to stern. Beyond the reach of Hal's torch beam, the corridor stretched out into darkness, and I felt the cavernous immensity of the ship all around me, a lair of unseen spaces. This way, said Hal, starting down another ladder, to the keel catwalk. Maybe it was the ship's wooden ribs, or my sky suit, or the tanked air I carried on my back, but with every slow, careful step, I felt like a deep-sea diver. The air around me was as cold and heavy as arctic water. Take out your torches, Hal said, when we'd all reached the bottom. I switched mine on. I had expected many things, but not the sight that greeted us. It was like the inside of a shipwreck, frozen at the ocean's floor. All the tanks and pipelines overhead had burst, and their various liquids, water, fuel, and lubricants, had congealed mid-flow. Great oily stalactites spiked from overhead, releasing phantasmagoric rainbows as our torch beams struck them. Walls and girders and wires bore coatings of frost in purples and oranges and blood reds that resembled strange coral and sea anemones. The Aruba fuel had turned brilliant green as it froze and shaped itself into bizarre spirals and arches and buttresses as though an army of pixie artisans had been hard at work. Control car first, said Hal, unmoved by the unearthly beauty around him. He led the way cautiously forward. Dorje, I noticed, was deftly making a map as he went. We paused only to throw open the doors of a few crew cabins. In two, my torch beam passed over the dark hump of sailors, frozen in their bunks. They looked like the bodies found in Pompeii after Vesuvius had erupted. That's how I want to go, Hal said, in my sleep. Whatever it was that doomed the Hyperion forty years ago, it had happened swiftly and at night. We descended an icy ladder to the control car. The high windows were thick with frost, but let in enough light so that we could turn off our torches. Rivulets of frozen water corded the glass and walls. Icicles hung from the ceiling. Most of the crew lay twisted on the floor, their bodies fused with pools of ice. The captain, hat still atop his head, perched on the stool before the rudder wheel, his torso slumped against it. His hands gripped the spokes, though I saw they were no longer connected with his wrists. They had snapped off long ago. What happened to them all? Kate wondered aloud. The sight of all these dead men was truly terrible to behold. 
and my mind became very practical and turned them into objects, or else I could not have looked upon them with a steady eye or pulse. The captain twitched suddenly, and I gave a shout, but it was only the wheel moving, shaking his rigid body as it turned. That's good news, said Dorje, watching the wheel turn. The rudder chains are still working, I said, glad to be fixing my mind on concrete matters. We can steer her at least, said Hal. We won't be at the mercy of the winds quite as much. I told Jangbu we'd heave to if we could. That should keep us out of trouble for the salvage. What's heaving to? Nadira asked. Bringing the ship into the wind, I told her, and locking her rudder to keep her stationary. Even with only four engines, the saga would provide enough power to keep the Hyperion from blowing backward. Hal and Dorje unceremoniously took hold of the captain and wrenched him off his stool. They tipped him against the wall. Hal took hold of the wheel. Let's see how she moves. For forty years, the winds alone had steered the Hyperion. Now she once more had a helmsman. Very slowly, Hal turned the wheel. She's moving, I said. Knowing that Jangbu above needed to match the saga to his movements, Hal brought the Hyperion about gradually. That should do it. Let's tie her off, he said. Dorje took two ropes from his rucksack, and he and I worked together to secure the wheel. The Hyperion wavered in the wind, wanting to turn, but the rudder held her in check, aided by the Sagarmatha's powerful engines overhead. We still drifted slightly, but no longer rode the sky like a porpoise. That's much better, said Kate. The ship's clock had stopped at 2348 hours. I looked at the altimeter, the glass dome cracked, the needle frozen at 19,625 feet. She went too high, I said. That's what killed everyone. This was no mutiny, no pirates either. Everyone was still at their posts or asleep. No, said Hal. This altitude isn't fatal. It is if she rose fast enough. Why would she? Hal asked. An updraft, maybe. I saw it on the flotsam. If they went from 2,000 to 20,000 feet in a minute, it might have undone them. They froze to death, you mean? Nadira asked. No, I said. They would have suffocated long before that. Going up so fast, it would have been like having all the air sucked out of their lungs. They would have passed out. That's why everyone is on the floor. Only the captain managed to hang on for a bit. Dorjane silently nodded his agreement. Well, it's a nice theory anyway, said Hal. I hope you're right. If they weren't attacked by pirates, it means we'll be the first to plunder her holds. Let's get moving. A sound very much like someone exhaling whispered through the control car. We all went rigid. My eyes skittered over the bodies on the floor, half expecting them to stir and crack free of the ice. Hal, a pistol suddenly in his hand, whirled toward the ladder, which was the only way in and out of the control car. No one was poised on its rungs, or in the hatchway above. Who's there? he shouted. Crossness, came the reply. This time I caught its source and gave a shout, pointing. The unearthly whisper was emanating from an icy grill mounted on the side of the control car. It was the end point of the crow's nest speaking tube. Heat flashed across my back and down my arms. I pictured the lookout raising the mouthpiece to his frozen lips, exhaling his last sounds from his ice-crusted throat. We stared, mute, at the grill. Yes, said the voice. And then it became nothing more than a shushing of dead air along the speaking tube. It's just the wind, Kate said, making voices. Obviously. Hal agreed. We all cleared our throats and gave dry little laughs and generally tried to make light of it. You brought a pistol, I said to Hal. 
Just a negotiating tool, he said. You never know who else might show up claiming right of salvage. Look at this, said Kate. She was standing at the navigation table, peering down through the thick ice flow that had formed over the chart. Its markings were all but obliterated, but I could still make out the telltale outlines of Norway and Finland and the coast of Russia. Grunel was supposed to be flying to America, so why would they have a chart of Scandinavia and Russia? Curious, but it still doesn't matter, said Hal, barely taking a glance. I want to get to those holds. Back up the ladder we went, and aft along the ice-encrusted keel catwalk, past the companion ladder we'd come down, squeezing around stalactites. We soon reached a short stairway that led up to the main passenger deck, but Hal ushered us past, saying we'd return later. On either side of the corridor we passed the closed doorways of the kitchens and pantry and various other crew's quarters. Some of the doors were half-sealed behind frozen waterfalls, and it would take some doing to crack through. Our five torch beams plowed the darkness before us as we entered the guts of the ship. Cargo bays are usually built amidships, port and starboard, so their weight is evenly distributed at the ship's center. On either side of the catwalk were built strong walls, much higher than the usual cargo bay. These ones were two stories tall, and were not made of wood, but metal, studded with rivets. They looked impregnable as a battleship's armor. Hal came to a stop. On the port side of the catwalk, there was a single door, glinting with mauve frost. There was no sign. In the door center was a metal plate with a handle, and below it, a complicated circular keyhole. Here we are, said Hal. The treasure trove.